Hey, I'm Rob Jones and welcome to Tech Talk on Loop TV. This episode is the last of three parts looking at logic. In the previous two episodes, we saw how to record and then edit guitar and vocal parts, as well as how to create a few accompanying rhythm tracks to go with them. This time, we're going to take a look at Logic's drum synth and sampler, Ultrabeat, and how it can be used to create some natural sounding drums to go with our song. The template session that we first loaded up had a couple of drum tracks in, containing the two sampled studio drum kits that come with Ultrabeat, Studio Tight Kit and Studio Brush Kit. With a kit loaded, Ultrabeat can be played like any other sampler, and each MIDI note triggers a different drum sound as you can see by the keys running up the left side of the assignment area. To make things easy for you, Logic have created some patterns using Ultrabeat's built-in sequencer, so that the drums can be played instantly when you load up a template. To try out different patterns, you can select another choice from the pattern list at the bottom, and the sequencer locks to the song tempo, so we'll always play in time with your session. The sequencer strip running along the bottom allows you to program each drum by turning on steps along a grid. But you can only see whatever drum is selected, and not all the drums at once. So a better way of working with it is to click on Full View, which turns off the synth parameter area in the center and replaces it with a grid showing all of the drums. This is much easier to see what's being played, and add or remove drums as you like. Meanwhile, the assignment area provides mixer controls that can be used to change any of the drum levels by clicking and dragging the blue strips up and down. Once you've chosen or created a pattern that you want to loop, you may decide to edit it in the Arrange window instead, as this provides much more flexibility. So what you can do is just drag out the pattern, which creates a MIDI region on the track with the drums sequenced as they were in Ultrabeat. What I've done for the track is to take a two-bar loop, but only loop the first bar of it for the majority of the song, bringing in the second bar at the end of phrases to act as a fill. So now we can add some effects to the drums to make them sound better. I've chosen to keep some of the effects that were already on the track, and then add some new ones too. What we've got is a compressor beefing up the sound a bit, it's set to peak detection so it's fast acting, with medium, threshold and ratio settings. Then it's going through an EQ to accentuate the kick and snare. Then it's being squashed to hell by a limiter, which loses the natural sound, but makes the drums much fatter. And then, for further effect, I've added Bit Crusher to distort the drums, which makes the sound dirtier and bigger still. Finally, there's tape delay on the end, with a fairly high feedback setting, and the bottom end filtered off the delayed sound so the kick doesn't get any messier. This adds a nice stuttered effect. As well as using synced delays in this way to create a slowly fading trail that's similar to reverb, another common way of using a delay is to set a very small delay time and no feedback. This creates a subtle, staggered doubling effect that gives a sound more character without making the mix any cloudier. This is a good effect to use on vocals, leads, more rhythmic melodic parts, or percussion. Hear how it sounds on the guitar part, for example. If I turn up the delayed signal first, so it's the same volume as the non-delayed one, then listen to the difference between 80 milliseconds and 40 milliseconds delay. The delay is less noticeable, so it just has the effect of thickening or stretching out the sound. If you reduce the wet slider now, then you can make the effect more subtle.
To take this even further, you could add a stereo delay, where either the left or right channel has a slightly longer delay than the other. This widens the sound even further, but of course in doing so, its position in the stereo field becomes less distinct. So you need to get the balance right between adding spaciousness and maintaining stereo positioning. This is an effect I often add to a vocal, but always on an auxiliary bus, so I can just dial in a small amount. One thing I get asked about a lot is mastering. A lot of people, especially beginners, are keen to know what they should be doing about mastering. The simple answer is, mastering is only really necessary if you're releasing music professionally. And even if you're sending your music away to labels, a good mix should be enough, especially if it's got a little compression on it. However, for anyone that wants to try out Logic's mastering tools, then there are a few different ones available. A couple that I use are Multipressor, which is Logic's multiband compressor, and Limiter, both of which are added as inserts to the stereo output track when you want to process the final mix. Multipressor is a four-band compressor that compresses four areas of the frequency spectrum individually. The settings for each band can be edited using the display or the parameters below. Each band has meters showing the input and output, with sliders alongside for setting the thresholds. The lower threshold is an expander that boosts the level of anything that falls below it, whilst the upper threshold is a regular compressor that flattens the level. You can see the amount of effect the compressors on each band are having on the graph. Then, once you're happy that the level is under control, you can turn up a band on the graph to boost just that compressed band of frequencies. So, to increase the bass, you turn up band 1. The limiter is a simpler device to get your head round. It's basically a compressor with brick wall settings, so it prevents the signal from going over the maximum digital level. A gain slider can be used to turn up the level before limiting takes place. So, the higher this value, the more the signal will be squashed. Like on a normal compressor, you can see how much of an effect the limiter is having by the gain reduction meter. So if you want to apply some gentle limiting to make sure that the level is under control, then reduce the gain slider to a point where the gain reduction meter is only showing the odd flicker here and there. When you're happy with your mix and want to export the song as an audio file, then you just click on the bounce switch. This opens a window where you can select the start and end positions of the track. And then various settings for the file format. The first box is for uncompressed formats. So once you've selected that, you can choose between WAV, IF, SD2 and CAF in the options to the right, as well as a bit depth and sample rate. Down at the bottom there's also an option for selecting whether to normalise the waveform or not. This means that the waveform is turned up so it's as loud as possible, without clipping. It's a good option for exporting a waveform if you've not applied any compression to the master, as it makes it as loud as it can be without squashing the dynamic range. So that's the last of the episodes on Logic. It's been fun working on a more acoustic track, and I'm pleased to see that Logic has a lot to offer in terms of real sounding instruments, as well as electronic ones. The new features of Logic 9 really open up the software too, giving you even more control over the various parts of your song, whilst maintaining the high standard of audio quality that's produced throughout. For more information on Logic, check out the Apple website. See you next time.